Yeah, we're delighted to be sharing another Glad Tidings Hour program with all you dear friends out there who follow us week by week. It's a joy to share a message that is living and a Saviour who is alive forevermore. And we trust that through this message and through this program, you will be blessed, you will be challenged and inspired, and that Jesus Christ will get all the glory and in everything that he will have the preeminence. So we're going to commence with a great hymn, Victory in Jesus. Isn't that good today to have a victorious Saviour and then to have his victory in our lives too? And this is a song uh, that was recorded uh, quite a number of years ago by the Faith Mission Bible College Choir. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Saviour forever. He sought me and bought me with his own precious blood. And just after this song, then Yvonne, my wife, is going to come and share with you her story for our program today. good hymn to introduce my story today, on the 8th of May. On that date in 1945, 
VE or Victory in Europe Day was first celebrated. One of my sisters was born five days before VE Day, so she was given Victoria as her middle name. I'm a post-war model. Tuesday the 8th of May 1945 was an emotional day that millions of people had been waiting for. They were extremely happy that the fighting had stopped and there were big celebrations and street parties. Huge crowds, many dressed in red, white and blue, gathered outside Buckingham Palace in London. VE Day meant an end to nearly six years of a war that had cost the lives of millions, had destroyed homes, families and cities, and had brought huge suffering and privations to the populations of entire countries. Cities in USA and Britain, as well as formerly occupied cities in Western Europe, displayed flags and banners rejoicing in the defeat of the Nazi war machine during World War II. Upon the defeat of Germany, celebrations erupted throughout the Western world, especially in the United Kingdom and North America. More than one million people celebrated in the streets throughout the United Kingdom to mark the end of the European part of the war. About one million Germans had attempted a mass exodus to the West when the fighting in Czechoslovakia ended, but were stopped by the Russians and taken captive. They took approximately two million prisoners in the period just before and after the German surrender. Meanwhile, more than 13,000 British prisoners of war, POWs as they were called, were released and sent back to Great Britain. It surely was a time of great jubilation. Many stories of horror for some and relief for others have been recorded, but many more atrocities have been committed since then all over the world, right up to our present day. Jesus warned his disciples on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, verses 6 to 8. Ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers or in many places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. But praise God, Jesus came into this dark, sin-cursed world, to bring freedom. He came to set sinners free from the penalty and power of sin and he is still doing that today. At the beginning of his earthly ministry we read in Luke chapter 4 and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now since glad tidings are went online over two years ago, I have recorded well over a hundred stories and interviews of God's saving power in the lives of individuals from various walks of life. Some became great hymn writers and others became great soul winners in foreign lands. 
Many hymns have been written about the joy of being set free from sin. Here is one written by Haldor Lelinus, which you may know. The first verse reads, Once I was bound by sin's galling fetters, chained like a slave, I struggled in vain, but I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my fetters in twain or in two. Haldor was born in Norway in 1885. His father was a farmer and a storekeeper. The Lelinus family farm consisted of 15 acres of rocky ground and the year after Haldor was born his parents decided to emigrate to America. Like many Scandinavians at that time he was raised in a devoutly religious Lutheran family. When he was 15 he became a confirmed member of the Lutheran Church. However, he says in his autobiography that at that time he had not experienced the miracle of the new birth. Shortly after his mother's death, one summer evening, he paused to listen to a street corner service. That night he made his decision to devote his life to Christ. The singing and testimonies brought conviction to his heart and later that year he was saved. He became a minister in several Methodist Nazarene churches throughout the USA and is said to have composed 4,000 hymns. Here is one of them. His testimony in song. Now it's taken from a CD we made many years ago when our children were still at home.
Wesley, co-founder of Methodism in the 18th century, also wrote in his hymn, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. Let's listen to Machrafelt Free Presbyterian Church Choir singing it. Wesley was converted on the 21st of May, 1738, and his brother John three days later, on the 24th of May. Now, over the next two weeks, I want to tell you more about the Wesley brothers and the revival fires which swept our nation and farther afield at that time, so don't miss those programmes. But just now, Mildred Rainey will bring our story to a close by singing Charles' majestic hymn, Jesus, the name high over all, with Jesus, the prisoner's fetters breaks. Jesus, the name high over all, in hell or earth or sky. Speaks and cries. 
life into the dead Oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of His grace The arms of love that compass me Saving grace proclaim Tis all my business here below To cry, behold the Lamb Happy if with my latest breath I might but gasp His name Preach Him to all and cry in death people long to be free from many things in this day and age, but there is no greater longing that could be placed within a heart than to be set free from the dominating tyranny of sin. And praise God we have a Savior who has come to do that very thing. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Praise the Lord. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And it's our privilege to be able to share that message wherever we go, in services uh, in our province, Northern Ireland, or wherever else we uh, visit. And, of course, especially through Glad Tidings Hour here on Facebook or on the website cfmireland.org or, again, through YouTube. And then many of you as well follow us on our special programs we do each month for Disabled Christians Fellowship in Ireland. And that's on YouTube as well. Some of you may not have discovered that yet, but if you have, you know what we do there. And you can look that up as well and enjoy it for the Lord's glory. I'm going to read to you just now from the book of Acts today, first chapter, and commencing to read at verse 1, the first 11 verses. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Luke is the writer of this book, the book of Acts. So here we are, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. 
We're going to conclude our Bible reading there at verse 11, and we trust the Lord will bless the Word of God to our hearts. Now, let's take a few moments to pray before we come to the message for today. Our Father, we thank and praise Thee today for Jesus, the great liberator, the great emancipator of the people and those who are bound and those who are blind and those who are dead in trespasses and in sin. And thank you this day that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we pray today, Lord, that wherever it goes and whoever listens to it, that again the message will do its work in the heart. Bless your people today and be with us, loving Lord, and guide us in these concluding moments of this program. We pray in the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Well, my message today is entitled, A Parting Message. And it's taken and based upon those words that we read from the book of Acts, the first chapter, the first 11 verses. We read these words. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. That, of course, is the record that is left for us regarding our Lord's ascension, his departure, and his going back to be in the presence of the Father and back to the glory. We're indebted to Luke, the writer of the third gospel, and the follow-up record of Acts for the accounts of the final moments of Christ's earthly presence with his disciples. Mark makes a very brief reference to that parting in the closing words of his gospel, but it's Luke who captures the momentum that was building up to the actual ascension of their master. We have the concluding remarks. We have the last short walk together out to Bethany the closing benediction, and the awesome scene of Jesus ascending higher and higher until he disappeared from their sight. Immediately afterward, they were astounded by the appearance of two shining messengers. And they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. Yes, He will return just as he departed. Parting words are important, but the significance of Christ's final message cannot be overestimated. It was going to be the blueprint for the mission of these men and for the cause of the kingdom until Jesus would return. The pattern is presented in the combined testimony of Luke's two accounts. So I'm going to be drawing in these moments from the last verses of Luke's Gospel and these early verses of the record of the book of Acts. So first of all, the dominant message of the kingdom. And we need to go to Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 49 for that account. And what do we read there? Well, here's what we read. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The purpose of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus was to provide redemption from sin. We read right throughout the New Testament that uniform message and emphasis of a Redeemer, that we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, be glory and dominion forever and ever. And it's no surprise that we should say amen to that. So it's not a surprise either that this message is the message that these men were commanded to preach throughout the world, beginning at Jerusalem. And in verse 47 
as we read through these final words of Luke's gospel on that bedrock of Calvary's redemptive work. They were to preach repentance and remission. Repentance from sin and remission for sin. The commission has never been repealed. Repentance and the message of remission through the precious blood shedding of our Savior. Repentance is not a popular message, and it may not be popular in your thoughts today. It may not uh, occur in your thinking even, but people don't like to be faced with their sin. They get a little bit bristly about that, you know, even today. But it is an even less appreciated message when you say to people, you need to forsake your sin. You need to turn from it. And that's the first challenge in the giving up uh, of your sin. That's the first challenge that comes to you, the giving up of your sin. Yes, it is. And there's no way around this issue. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Peter the Apostle that we've been referring to in recent weeks in our ministry, he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Again, he preaches in the book of Acts later on. I think it is the Apostle Paul, of course, at that time, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The bitter pill of repentance, thank God, is followed by the sweet message of remission. And if you are willing today, unconverted man or woman, if you are willing to give up your sin, willing to repent of all your past life and transgression, as the Holy Spirit moves upon your heart, then thank God I've got a message for you. There is forgiveness with the Lord. He will not always chide, neither will he hold his anger forever, because... He delighteth in mercy. And it is the mercies of the Lord today that you and I have the privilege of experiencing forgiveness and acceptance with God. Praise the Lord today. There is a remedy for the unforgiven past. There is an answer to the accusations of an accusing conscience and an offended God. And it is the free and full forgiveness that is provided through faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There are some beautiful hymns about it, more than I could even take time to mention today, but let me quote this wonderful verse. Love brought my Savior here to die on Calvary. For such a sinful wretch as I, how can it be? Love bridged the gulf twixt me and heaven, taught me to pray. I am redeemed set free, forgiven, love found a way. Isn't that what Yvonne has been emphasizing in her message today? Isn't that just what we're speaking about right now? How to be set free, how to be forgiven, how to be accepted of God. And it's through humility of heart and true repentance and accepting the finished work of the cross and through the life-giving power of a risen Savior, you can have all this today as God's free gift. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, that's the simplicity and the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it is when we read Luke's account of these men in the book of Acts, it is obvious that they were faithful to their responsibility. They preached repentance and remission of sins wherever they went. And my message today is to declare the message of repentance from sin and remission for sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. But then it becomes your responsibility to accept the message and act upon it. So there's the first emphasis in our message today. The second emphasis on this parting message that the Savior left with his disciples was with regard to the dynamic presence that would accompany their ministry. We find in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, Jesus said, Behold, that means take note, 
I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, where Luke takes up again his correspondence with his friend Theophilus, having referred to the Gospel of Luke, he says, Now I'm writing to you again, Theophilus, and here's what I'm telling you. Being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. And then he said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So Luke was making sure that his friend Theophilus was made aware of the supernatural presence which attended the ministry of the apostles. God the Holy Spirit would account for the gripping impact of their preaching, their fearless bravery and the fierce opposition that opposed them at times, their triumphant testimony as they faced torture and martyrdom. They had no grand academic certificates to hang on their walls, but it was the ordination and the anointing of the Spirit of God that set them on their course. And with the hostile forces arrayed against them and the unpopularity of their message, it would have been no great surprise if their mission had failed. But I was reading Dr. A. W. Tozer, and I was really impressed with this uh, comment in his book, Power from on High, that the church did not so perish like many other abortive sects before her. It was entire due to the miraculous element within her. And that element was supplied by the Holy Spirit who came at Pentecost to empower her for her task. For the church was not an organization merely, not a movement, but a walking incarnation of spiritual energy. I like that. A walking incarnation of spiritual energy. In short, the church began in power, moved in power, and moved just as long as she had power. And that's the end of the quotation from Dr. Tozer. An honest analysis of the 21st century church is the uncomfortable presence of lukewarmness and compromise and encroaching worldliness. And we really do need, dear friends, we really do need a fresh outpouring of the purifying Spirit of God, consuming the dross and the dust that are smothering the flame of God in the hearts of God's people. Oh, for a new anointing. Oh, for a new outpouring, dear friends, of pure power from on high, equipping us, equipping the church, equipping us as individuals, yes indeed, for the gigantic challenges that are before us. This and this alone will match the opposition and the hostility that is all around us these days and the counterfeit, the flame of God, the Spirit of the Lord resting upon the people of God and making the church a living moving ministry in the hearts and lives of men and women. May the Lord set our hearts aflame and set our hearts on fire for Jesus Christ and his glory with the power of the Spirit of God promised right here by our Savior, the dynamic presence that accompanied their ministry. Oh, it's my prayer, my dear people, that that would accompany my ministry. And it's my prayer that it would accompany your ministry and your life as well as you serve the Lord. The third and final thought is the departing assurance to the disciples. In chapter 1 of the book of Acts and verse 11, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus 
shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In the gospel that Luke has written, he says in his final verses, he led them out as far as to Bethany. My dear friends, how often he visited Bethany. How he loved to go to the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Wonder did he call with them as he was going out there. He led the disciples out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them. He was parted from them and carried up into heaven. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, Luke picks it up again with his friend Theophilus and writes these words to him. While they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. I wondered as I was preparing my message, I, I wonder how I would have felt at that moment. I know what it's like when you part company with a special friend and you know that you're not going to see them on this earth again. I've been that way and I know what it's like. We have no account how long these men stood gazing upward after his departure, but I'm sure there were many emotions going through their inmost spirit. But their concentration was interrupted when these two shining messengers appeared with this message, he will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The New Testament abounds with such messages. Over 300 times, directly and indirectly, we are reminded that Jesus is coming again. His purpose for returning is to bring an end to this age of grace, this period of the ministry of the Spirit. And he is coming again, not to die, not to be set at naught, not to suffer, not to be crucified. He is coming back for those who belong to him. The fruits of his passion, we might call it. No time is revealed to these disciples as to when he would return. So no time must be wasted. They had been given a commission and they needed to carry it out. And so it is in our case. The signs of the times are upon us. We have no time to waste. There is the commission of the Master to work while it is yet day. The night cometh, says the Bible, when no man can work. When General Douglas MacArthur left the Philippines in March 1942 to take command of the South Pacific Allied Forces, he told the people of the Philippines, I came through. I shall return. In October 1944, Douglas MacArthur fulfilled that promise. And so it is with our great commander, Jesus. He came through. He will return. In the meantime, his message is, Occupy till I come. The disciples lost no time. It tells us in the very next verse, verse 12 of Acts 1, that they returned to Jerusalem. They joined over a hundred other believers to await the fulfillment of the promise of the Father. And how important those days were. And that ultimately they were endued with the Spirit of God for the great task of evangelism. Likewise, we too need to experience the divine anointing before we engage in the work of God. Otherwise, we are weak and ill-prepared for the challenges that we will encounter. And then there is the solemn matter of having made preparation for the Lord's return. While many of you who have listened and do listen today and other days and other weeks are in the kingdom, someone perhaps today listening to me now has made no preparation for this next great event in the Lord's calendar. Instead of being saved and ready, you are unsaved and therefore unprepared for the Lord's return. And my final words and parting message to you is urgent and sincere. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. My dear friends, 
He's near to you now by the ministry of His Spirit. He wants to bring you to Himself, to draw you as you repent of your sin. And He wants to forgive you and make you His very own. And then He wants to take that redeemed life and endure you with the power of His Spirit, that you then become a disciple, a follower, a soul winner for Jesus, and that you perpetuate the message of the grace of God through the precious name of Jesus, the work of the cross, the resurrection message, and that through it you too might see others come to this wonderful Savior. So, now is the time to settle your soul's salvation. And for all those today who know and love the Savior, if you have never really truly sought the Lord for His divine uh, coming upon you in power by His Spirit, purifying and empowering your life to serve Him, then now is the time too, because we are sanctified by faith just as much as we are justified by faith. And if it is by faith, then why not now? So let's be at our best for Jesus and living out in a life of Holy Ghost, fire and endowment for the King and for His kingdom. So, a brief recap, the dominant message of the kingdom, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and the sequel, remission of sin. The dynamic presence in the ministry of our lives what is it? Who is it? It is the Spirit's ministry in a life that is filled and Spirit anointed, the promise of the Father made real in you. And the departing assurance that was left to the disciples, He will return. And oh, how we want to meet Him with our lamps trimmed and burning and our garments all white, so that when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, we will be with him, caught up to be forever with the Lord. Well, may God bless the message to your hearts today that Yvonne and I have left with you up to this moment. The last message of our program today is another song by Mildred Rainey, In These the Closing Days of Time. So let's listen to it right now. In these the closing days of time What joy the glorious hope affords That soon no wondrous truth sublime He shall reign King of kings and Lord of lords He's coming soon, He's coming soon With joy we welcome His returning it may be morn, it may be night or noon, we know He's coming soon. The signs around in earth and air are painted on the starlit sky. God's faithful witnesses declare that the coming of the Savior draweth nigh. He's coming soon, He's coming soon, with joy we welcome His returning. It may be morn, it may be night or noon, we know He's coming soon. The dead in Christ who neath us lie, in countless numbers all shall rise When through the portals of the sky He shall come to prepare our paradise And we who living yet remain Caught up shall meet our faithful Lord This hope we cherish not in vain but we comfort one another by this word He's coming soon, He's coming soon With joy we welcome His returning 
It may be morn, it may be night or noon, we know he's coming soon. Our king is coming soon. Thank you today again for your encouragements, your prayer support, and may God bless you each one and be with you until we present our next program. In the will of the Lord, Eric Stewart saying, bye-bye. <laughs>